remarkable, what a remarkable life this really is when we look at it. The penances he endured, the eccentric behaviors, yeah, they're there. Um, and when we look at those aspects of his life, we have to say, along with St. Ignatius of Loyola, there is a rule for studying the biography of a saint. It's one of the most important contributions Ignatius of Loyola has made to Christian understanding. There is a rule to engaging the biography and the model of a saint, and it's this. The saints are to be always admired and seldom imitated. And why? Because our immature hearts try to look at the great things they've done, and in our immaturity, we think we can do it too. We look at the works of their maturity in our immaturity and say, that's what I'm going to do. And we're not ready. And we're not capable. And so when we look at Father de Montfort, especially in the odder behaviors of his life, and there are several of those, one of the things we want to keep in mind is that my spiritual maturity and his are not the same. Were there behaviors that he had that undoubtedly needed to be corrected? Of course! Because he wasn't sinless and perfect. Nor are we. But then there are other things he does that are curious, difficult to understand, and we do have to fall silent in front of them, simply saying, and how much of this is the product of an experience of God that I just don't know? And so we want to be careful with those things. But where we look safely at his example, where we look safely at his example, we see that from beginning to end, there is an identification with the person of Jesus. And it runs through his life. Jesus had no place to rest his head. I won't either. Jesus relied on the providence of God. I will too. So much so that when he visited his friend Canon Blaine late in his life, and he was frustrated because he could find no priests to regularly continue working with him except for one or two, and who weren't committed to carrying on the work afterwards. He was frustrated he couldn't share the fullness of his vocation with anybody. And his friend, Jean-Baptiste, looked at him and said, Louis, you think maybe because you're asking too much of the people who work with you? Do you think maybe you've set the standard too high? You might be on the path to sainthood, but does a guy have to be a saint just to work with you? You know, that's, that's what Canon Blaine said to his friend. It's a fair set of questions. It's a very fair set of questions. But then he says, and Lewis reached into his traveling bag and pulled out his New Testament. And he showed it to me and he said simply, what word in here do you want me to change? And what, what a remarkable statement that is that part of his frustration was the natural frustration of man who will not settle for anything less than the fullness of the gospel is going to have. However imperfect his living of it, part of his frustration was that frustration which is going to come to anyone whose heart is given over to the fullness of the gospel. I can safely say my heart is obviously not given over that fully yet because I don't have that degree of frustration. Um, but what an interesting thing is great frustration on some levels. It's not that people don't understand me. It's not that people don't like me. It's this mission I have I so want to share. And I'm having such a difficult time finding one to share it with. 
And what is the essence of apostleship? <coughs> to share the mission of Christ. And then, then there's the cross. Then there's the cross. And again, we say it over and over again. Father de Montfort loved the cross. But we often don't reflect on just how he loved the cross. And there are a number of stories about the cross in his life that we commonly tell. And yet the very essence of his love for the cross is found in some stories that Abbe Grande tells. Yeah. We've all heard the story of Calvary at Pont Chateau. What we often don't hear is how the story ends. That after the bishop reinforced that from France, from the royal court, the order has come, the Calvary is not just interdicted, but it must be destroyed. After the Calvary was torn down, Father de Montfort went away to make a retreat, which is understandable, right? The bishop was worried about it. The bishop did not want to give that order, but the bishop's hands were tied by the government. And so the bishop went to the retreat house, figuring Louis de Montfort is just going to be a wreck, and I will need to console him. And Father de Montfort spent a day and a half consoling the bishop. <laughs> he was already over the disappointments, glorying, glorifying God and thanking him for the share of the humiliation of his son. So much so that his job was to care for the bishop. <laughs> and you know, what a remarkable thing that was. He was preaching one day at a mission, and the mission was wildly <coughs> successful. People were coming to confession. Folks were responding to the preaching. The prayer was filled with fervor. There was joy in the singing. You know, and we're sitting here thinking, I would kill to give a mission like that. You know, I would kill to be that successful just once in my life. And so this is going on, and the response is remarkable. The pastor is cooperative. The divisions in the parish are being healed. And in the middle of the mission, Father Montfort is packing his bags. And when the priest who's working with him comes into the room, he's, Father, where are you going? What are you doing? We still have three or four weeks of the mission left. And Louis de Montfort says, this is a disaster. Nothing is any good. We have to leave and go to the next place. And his brother priest is looking at him. Louis, there are conversions. There is joy. Divisions have been healed. Listen to the singing. Even the pastor is completely cooperative, and this doesn't always happen. You know that. Everybody loves you here. And he looked at him and said, and that is the trouble. The cross is nowhere to be found. I need to go. Imagine that. We're too successful. We're too successful. It's too easy. Apparently, it took this other priest all night long to talk Louis de Montfort out of me. <laughs> and he did so by basically saying, then, Father, maybe this is your cross. You know, what, a, what an attitude. What an attitude. Every other one of us will be loving that unexpected success. Thank you, Lord, for this moment of grace, etc., etc., etc. And there's Lewis saying, if I don't see the cross, I don't trust it. If I don't feel the cross, I don't trust it. I want no foundation other than the cross. Poor Davis Homer, why did God become man? For the cross. For the cross. He came fixing his eye. Again, Mother Turner was, he fixed his eye on that tree. That rugged dead tree on the hill of Calvary and said, I will go there. And so for Father de Montfort, that is the movement of Jesus in the New Testament. His eye is always fixed on that tree where he is going. 
And so what does he do as time goes on in his vocation? More and more surely, he fixes his eye on that same cross of Jesus. And some of the eccentricities, some of the behaviors we see in his life are related to that. Their ways, their ways of focusing him, of allowing him to taste in a small way the presence of the cross, of maintaining contact with the cross, precisely, precisely so that he can possess it, or more that it can possess him. Humility, obedience, liberality, drive to the cross, and finally, missionary zeal. We mentioned it at the beginning in that story about Canada. Right. He's so enthusiastic, he's going to run after the savages and be lost <laughs> in the woods. <laughs> but now, but th then this becomes, this becomes now the engine of his vocation as he leaves the seminary. I have a burning desire to make our Lord and Our Lady known and to work with a small band of priests teaching catechism to the poor. Why the poor? No one else was going there. When he was traveling, he didn't seek out first the bigger cities because there were many priests who went there. When he went to the bigger cities, he sought the poorer neighborhoods because no one wanted to go there. But everywhere he went, whether he was dealing with the wealthy, and he did deal with the wealthy, whether he was dealing with the middle class, and he did deal with the young middle class in France, that's where Blessed Marie Louise Trichet came from, When he was dealing with the poor, when he was dealing with the soldiers, when he was dealing with religious, his preoccupation was always on the well-being of their souls. Even as he ministered to the poor and cared for their needs or saw to their education, he was always preoccupied as well with the issue of their salvation. And in fact, Abbe Grande says, when he worked with the poor, one of the things he did, and I've never seen this mentioned in another one of his biographies, one of the things Abbe Grande mentions is that when he worked with the poor, he made it a point as he was serving them to warn them about the particular sins their poverty might cause them to it was interesting. He gave them the dignity of meeting them in their poverty, but he also warned them about their poverty. About how there can be an anger that festers within you. About how there can be a deceitfulness and even a grasping after material things, which is just as strong as you see in the rich, if you are not careful. How there can be a despair that takes hold of you if you're not careful, and these things aren't good. And you must learn to draw the grace of Our Lady to keep you safe from these things. Very interesting. You know, he was one of those who identified completely with the poor, but who never surrendered to their condition, because he knew that poverty must be evangelized too. So that the dignity of the gospel, which can be present in poverty, can express itself. He knew he couldn't take away their material condition. There were too many of them. It was too great. But he also knew he could help them live in that condition with dignity. And so his work with them was never mere charity. It was never just evangelization. It was never just let me teach you catechism. That's important and necessary. But it was also never just material relief. Let me help you. It was always both. And this insistence on helping them discover their true dignity so that they could live it. 
and that that dignity is founded on the gospel and no place else. In the same way, when he worked with the rich, it wasn't just to criticize them for having a lot of things. It was also to open their eyes to the abundance they were blessed with and the fact that they were accountable to that abundance and for that abundance. That if God had given it to them, they who freely received should freely give. And because they have a dignity too and a mission too. And out of the richness they've received, they can show the providence of God to others if their eyes are open and they don't cling to what they have. But interesting how as he preached, he didn't give less of the gospel to somebody because he was poor or more of the gospel to somebody because he was rich. Rather, it was what is the appropriate word of the gospel, the full gospel, to either one of these. Always coming back to look at who you are before God and look at how you can show the face of Christ to the world. You who freely receive, freely must give. You who have nothing, Learn the dignity of a true dependence. Learn the dignity of a generosity which somehow makes nothing rich. This was the other thing. Going back to Cannon Lane, the wealthiest poverty in all of France was the poverty of St. Louis de Montfort. The poorest priest who gave more alms than anybody. One final example from his life is a contrast. There is a well-known series of accounts of the life of Father Jacques Ollier, who founded the great seminary of Saint-Sulpice in Paris. And Father de Montfort was formed in the system of Saint-Sulpice. Father Ollier was concerned with the poor of the city. And so he regularly, I believe it was weekly or every two weeks, would travel into the poor districts of Paris and he would travel to give alms to the poor. He traveled in his carriage. And so he left the comfortable house where he lived, got into his carriage, and his drivers took him into the poor neighborhood. The poor would approach the carriage, and out of the window of the carriage, he would distribute the alms, the charitable funds, sometimes the bread that he had for them. Now, when we hear that in our modern age, there can be a tendency to be very critical of this. And it's misguided. You know, oh, look at him. He was comfortable giving to the poor. He didn't really meet, him, meet them. That is, on some levels, there is you know, this tendency sometimes uh, where we, we love modern progressivism and we look at that and say, look, he failed to meet the poor. The simple fact of the matter is nobody else was going, and he was. Yeah. There were nobility, there were wealthy, there were many who didn't go. And by getting in his carriage on that regular basis, he was sending a message. Imperfectly, perhaps, but he was sending a message that the church must seek them, must find them. And no one's status is so high that he can't offer something. And so from St. Sulpice, even the founder, the director of the seminary, the great spiritual master who traveled among the nobles, who was well known by the nobility in Paris, who was the spiritual director to much of the nobility, he was sending a very strong message. Our modern eye might like to see something different, but the simple fact of the matter is nobody else was going. There was no other carriage going into those neighborhoods. This one was. And so it was the start of something. And that's important. That's important. Now look at Father Montfort in that same Paris. 
in that same Paris, but without a carriage, without fanfare. He simply shows up out of nowhere. You know, with Father Ollier's carriage, you knew when it was coming. You could see it coming down the street. You knew the schedule. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this priest just shows up. No one's sure where he came from. He's just suddenly there in the neighborhood. Presumably he walked because he doesn't have a horse. But he's just here, out of nowhere. There's nothing that draws much attention to himself. He's just another poor man in a sea of poor men until he raises his voice and begins acting. And then things are different. Because Father de Montfort doesn't have a comfortable home to go back to. And so he lives among them, dwells among them, walks among them, looks like they do, smells like they do, the whole bit. And within that, within that, Not just, not just the Lord came to make us rich. The Lord made himself poor, like us. And that poverty of the Lord was something he lived in, something he abided in, something he was born into at Bethlehem and never worked his way out of while he lived. And Father de Montfort, when he made that choice on that mysteriously long bridge at Sasson, when he made that choice, in a sense, he was not born, Father de Montfort was not born into poverty. Father de Montfort's family was not poor. They were not as well off as his father would have liked to have been, but they were not poor. Not by any measurable standard. But when he crossed that bridge, he made a choice. And in a sense, it was his moment of Bethlehem. He became born poor in his vocation. And he made it a point never to grow out of it or to work his way out of it because he chose it. And again, that mystery of the Incarnation, the Lord shows this and does not repent of the choice he has made in love. I am all yours. And the mystery of providence, freely you have received, freely then shall you give. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.